All right, the grave robber. I thought, what a great series, or name of a series, anyhow, to bring us into Halloween, because we're going to be in this one for a while, and I'm just excited. You know, oftentimes, we, uh, in general, I mean, maybe not all of us, but we kind of have this idea, or we have a thought that miracles are really limited to when Jesus was walking around on earth in his earthly ministry, like 2,000 years ago, and we just have this thought that they were. We tend to think that miracles are a thing of the past and not really for today. In the next several weeks with this um, series, I want us to go in, we're going to look at seven miraculous signs or seven miracles that are found, uh, that Jesus did, that are found in the Gospel of John. Super great book if you guys haven't read it. The Gospel of John is just wonderful. But we're going to look at these seven miraculous signs and they are going to show us that these Miracles are not simply something Jesus wanted to do in the past, but something that he desires to do in the future. And I am just excited to see that. And so, you know, we really have miracles happening all around us all the time, every day. It's just that the, the skeptical mind, or even some of us that just kind of get caught up in the day-to-day, and boy, myself included in this, I mean, life's busy, isn't it? And we start to kind of run in that race, we get in those patterns, and we can miss out on what's really happening around us. I mean, we have things like miracles are happening right now just through the air that we're breathing in down to the cells in our bodies, just doing incredible things that we never, ever think about. And and so we want to kind of talk about that today. You know, the most incredible miracle is the one that you saw this morning in the mirror. Your miracle. Now, I know a lot of us I'm going to be humble today. A lot of us don't look in the mirror and think, man, what a miracle, right? But the reality is, is that there's never been and there never will be another you. And I know that sounds like maybe like something on like a TV show or, you know, whatever to encourage you, but it's really true. You're a miracle. You'll never find uh, another person like you. You'll never find another you. And that is an incredible miracle. But that's not really a testimony to us or a testament of us. That's a testament of our creator, the one who created us. I mean, think about the billions of people on the face of the earth, and there's not one the same. That is just an incredible miracle. For instance, there's, you know, there's the, the things that happen around us, like we're what, 90, oh boy, here I just went and tried to make myself look smart, like 93 million miles or somewhere around in there away from the sun, and it takes the earth, like it's traveling, it's spinning at a thousand miles per hour, and we rotate the, the sun. I mean, just all this incredible stuff that's happening right now that we just completely take for granted. That is just a miracle that things like that happen. But even going farther into kind of like the microscopic is think of this. There's trillions of chemical reactions that are taking place every second in your body every day. You're inhaling oxygen, you're uh, creating energy, you're fighting off uh, antigens, manufacturing hormones, managing equilibrium, staying balanced, um, uh, filtering stimuli, mending tissue. Yes, I had to have notes for this. I didn't pay attention in science class, so here we go. (laughs) Purifying toxins, you're digesting food, um, you're, you're circulating blood. And here's just an an even bigger mind blow, is that all the while your brain is performing up to 10 quadrillion calculations at any given second using only 10 watts of power. Now, one of our uh, production guys back there will really like this one because that would take a computer to do the same process. That would take one gigawatt of power that would be powered by a nuclear power plant in order to do all that. We take 10 watts of power. I mean, it's just incredibly amazing the miracle that we are walking around with. And yet, I know, and I know many of you know, people that will say that they've never experienced a miracle in their life. They've never experienced a miracle. And I just want to say there's nothing further from the truth. Because miracles aren't just happening around us. You are a miracle. If you came in here today and you felt a little um, not sure of yourself, you're not sure your purpose, you're not sure where you belong, you feel a little bit like an outcast, let me tell you today that that is truth. You are a walking, living, breathing miracle. And that's not Pastor Josh. This is just biblical. We're going to go in that today. And we're going to take the next several weeks to see some incredible things through miracles. 
In the next few weeks, in the next several weeks, I want to challenge you guys to something. I want to challenge you guys to not miss the miracle. Don't miss the miracle. When we miss the miraculous in Jesus' life, we miss the miracle that God wants to do in our life. Oftentimes it is so easy to just brush off these, these things that Jesus did in the past and just call them, well, that's something that he did in the past and that's not really happening now. But if we choose to take those away, think about the implications of that. If we, if we say that he didn't turn water into wine or he didn't walk on the water and, and all these other things that we're going to be talking about, then we can't surely believe him that he was resurrected from the dead and that he's alive right now and he wants a relationship with us to walk through life with us. When we miss the miraculous in Jesus' life, we miss the miracle that God wants to do in our own. And I want to challenge you, don't miss the miracle, which means you have to show up for the next eight weeks every single Sunday. So this is just, whew, I'm excited to see you guys. This is great. we got to go through this together. One of the boldest statements in the Bible... One of the boldest statements, and, and I mean, we could probably say this about a lot, because let's be honest, um, when you read through some of what Jesus said, it's just incredibly bold. But one of the boldest things that he said is in, uh, we find it, it is out of the mouth of Jesus, it's in John fourteen twelve. it says this, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater than these because I am going to the Father. Now that is just a, that's a verse that we kind of, we have a tendency to pass over. We have a tendency to rationalize. We have a tendency just to kind of think, oh, you know, that's, that sounds great, but what does that really mean? I want to tell you what that means. Buckle up. Here it is. This simple. If you follow Jesus, you will do what he did. That's what that verse means. We can't miss it. Don't miss the miracle. If you follow Jesus, you will do what he did. Now follow with me just a little bit longer because some of you guys are thinking of already some things that Jesus did and you're like, there is no way, this guy's crazy. But here we go. If we follow Jesus, you will do what he did. You will seek the heavenly father first and foremost. Matthew 6, says, seek first. Out of the mouth of Jesus, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and all else will come to you. Oftentimes, Jesus would pull himself away and he would just seek after the Father. Even the night before he was, or the night that he was betrayed, what was he found doing? Meeting with the Father, crying, bleeding out, asking him to help him through life. When we follow Jesus, we'll do what he did. He, see, he was seeking after the Heavenly Father first and foremost. This will change our lives and the lives of those around us. You will care for the poor. You know, one of the most radical, crazy stories and saddest stories in the Bible is one called the rich young ruler, and you can find that in Mark 10 if you want to read through that. But Jesus looks at this wealthy young man who, by the way, was a very good man. He believed that Jesus was who he said he was. He followed the principles that Jesus had, but he meets Jesus one day, and he walks up to him and he says, Lord, what should I do to inherit the kingdom of God? What should I do? And he says, Jesus looks him in the eye, seeing his heart, and he says, sell everything you have, give it all to the poor, and then come follow me. And unfortunately, the only thing that we read of that story is that the man turned, walked away, never to follow Jesus again. But we can see the heart of Jesus was the poor that he wanted to care for the poor. And we see that many other times in Scripture. But Mark 10, you can read through that, and we can see that if we follow Jesus, that we'll do what he did. We'll care for the poor. We'll seek the Heavenly Father. We'll wash some feet. <laughs> I, just want, I thought I was going to get a different reaction on that one. But we'll wash some feet along the way. You know, Jesus has, um, we look in John 13, and you can see that Jesus teaches us how to serve others. How to serve others by, he gets his closest followers around him, his disciples, the 12 guys that hung out with him. And he takes off this, this uh, robe around him, and he gets down and he starts washing their feet. Well, why that is so disgusting is I'm sure most of us in here would not want to wash each other's feet, and don't worry, we're not going to do that here this morning. But I don't think we would even want to do that now. But then they walked around in sandals if they were lucky. Some of them were barefoot. So imagine walking miles and miles and miles on gravel and dust that you probably have cracks and all kinds of nastiness, right? 
And so Jesus gets down and he says, this is what it looks like to do the lowest thing because when you would walk into somebody's home back in those times, it would be the servant that was kind of at the bottom that would actually approach you and wash your feet. It was like a hospitality thing. And Jesus says, I don't get special treatment. This is how we serve others. If we follow Jesus, we will do what he did. We're going to seek the Father. We're going to care for the poor and we're going to wash some feet. We'll also offend some people along the way. Some of, that, some of us just got excited in here. Shame on you. <laughs> I'm teasing. But we're going to offend some people along the way. I mean, we see many stories, many, many stories of Jesus offending. I mean, just look at the cross. The reason that Jesus was on the cross is not just because that was something that he had to do. I mean, yes, that was, there was a purpose behind that. But he was schemed against. He was taunted. He was, he was lied to. And, and, and he was eventually taken, beaten, and put on the cross. This is because he offended people. His truth offended people. If we follow Jesus, we will do what he did. We're going to seek after the Heavenly Father. We're going to care for the poor. We're going to wash some feet, and we're going to offend some people. And here's where I want to kind of take us just a little bit today to kind of intro into this next series for the last few weeks, is that if we follow Jesus, we will do what he did, and we will live in the miraculous. We will live in the miraculous. Now, let me walk you down this a little bit because I'm not talking about that we will just experience miracles all the time. Let me just tell you one thing really quick. If anybody's preaching that to you, you might want to just check that because it's not always pleasant following Jesus. I mean, when we offend people and they come back at us, that's not always fun, right? When we're, when we're out serving, sometimes that's our time and it takes effort and we don't always want to wake up on a Sunday morning and come and put the stage together and things. It's not always pleasant. So I'm not talking that we are going to just experience miracle after miracle in our life when we follow Jesus. We're going to do what he did. What I'm saying is that you will be used to do miraculous things. You will be used to do miraculous things, and that should excite us here this morning. You will be a miracle. You will do miraculous things. Believe me when I tell you. Everybody catch this point today, please. Believe me when I tell you, you, yes, you, are somebody else's miracle. This is what Jesus intended to be because when we follow him, we will do what he did. We will seek the Father. We will care for the poor. We will wash some feet and we're going to offend some people. But we will live in the miraculous. We are somebody's miracle today. Buy into that. Believe that. When I was called to um, this church, one of the first things that God just laid on my heart is just a simple three-sentence phrase. It was love every blade of grass, love every crack in the sidewalk, and love every person there. There was nothing that said, Josh, I want you to look inward to yourself and I want you to be self-serving. I want you to do something for you. Everything that Jesus called me to do in this city was for others. Everything that Engage has to do, our mission statement, is that we connect people with God and we connect people with the church family. Why do we do that? So others can see Jesus and others can, can live out the life that Jesus did, that they can serve, they can care for the poor, they can do those things. We try to create environments to help this along. Now, hear me when I say only God can perform a miracle. So God gets all the glory. Only God can perform a miracle, so God gets all the glory. But when you read through Scripture, you realize and you see that there's a human element around every miracle. There's a human element around every miracle. Sometimes, you know, you need to step into the Jordan River like the priests of Israel did before God will part the waters. And so you just get down there, you step in, boom, it happens. It's just kind of this like right away thing. Other times you have to walk around a city seven times. And then God brings those walls down like he did in Jericho. So sometimes it's kind of this immediate response. It's this, we kind of see this immediate miracle answered or, or see that. Other times it takes some time. It takes us doing one thing and then the other. We just kind of got out of a couple week series where we were talking about picking one discipline to start doing and picking one thing that we need to stop in our lives. It's kind of a process. Sometimes miracles happen that way. It's not always instantaneously. So really, in other words, what I'm trying to say is that sometimes we have to do the natural before God will do the supernatural. 
And that sounds good, there's something for you guys to put down in your notes or remember, but really what we're talking about here is sometimes we need to step out in that obedience. Even if it's just the one foot into the Jordan River like the priest did, or maybe it takes us a year-long process to maybe get to a certain point where God's telling us to prepare to be. We have to do the natural before God will do the supernatural. I want to tell you a quick story. My stories are never quick, but I will try to burn through this one. There's so many testimonies in that. Guys, if you're ever interested, you have to sit down with some of the, um, I, don't, I don't mean to like separate people um, in categories here, but the original eight people that came here to plant this church, you have to sit down and hear some of the stories because you will not believe what God did to allow people to move to the city. For instance, I was sitting out in Bismarck, North Dakota, sleeping, super tired, and I just told you guys, God put something on my heart. I didn't hear an audible voice. There was no burning bush, nothing like that, but there was just a stirring to go to Duluth, Minnesota, a city that I had only driven through, never lived here, my wife never lived here, and I'll tell you what, it's been the best thing that ever happened. I can't believe that God lets me do ministry in a great city like this. I'm serious. I love it. There's a lot of brokenness here, but it is a great city. And so, so I just said, uh, I'm a youth pastor, never been a lead pastor. What are you asking me to do, God? This is weird. And I just started writing down on a piece of paper, and the first thing that I wrote, someday I'll show it, was love every blade of grass, love every crack in the sidewalk, and love every person there. And they took me to Abraham's story and I started reading all that and then I just chose I'm not going to doubt and I moved forward. And I started writing a letter to the people that could maybe help me do this. They didn't even know who I was. And all of a sudden doors started opening up. It took me doing something natural, obedience, before he could do something supernatural. After that, after I stepped out that way, I get a phone call from Tim and Cindy. And some of you guys don't know them here. I understand that. I'm going to use some names you don't know. They call me up. I've never met these people. They have me go out to Hoo Hut, which is a great restaurant. I recommend it for anybody that likes um, Mongolian barbecue type food. They take me out there. I'm thinking we're talking about church planting, like they're going to go somewhere. All of a sudden, I get a phone call two days after meeting them. Hey, we want to move to Duluth with you guys. What? Are you people crazy? They lived in a house for something like, I'm probably getting the number wrong, but like 32 years plus in Fergus. And they were like, we're just going to sell that thing, come up and trust God for the rest. And I'm like, no, seriously, like you're kind of crazy here, right? Like you're going to do that. And they did. Guess what? They didn't even have to put their house up for sale. A lady called them on the phone and says, I want to pay this for your house. Pretty much. You can ask them the story. I'm not exaggerating there. That's what happened. They sold their house like that. And then Tim's job allowed him to work from the home here. He didn't have to find another job. So really, it was loading up a semi-trailer full because they had a lot of stuff. Tim likes to collect. And, um, and they brought it here. Shane and Sarah, uh, she's back there doing the slides for us. She just came up to me one day, took me out to Red Lobster. So I thought that they were going to tell me bad news, but it actually ended up being good news. And they said, we're going to move with you to Duluth. We just feel like God's telling us. And again, I'm like, are you guys crazy? Like, there's no money in this. Like, this is a total, we're just throwing a line out. And they came. Shane actually wasn't sure what he was going to do for a job. And his company had an opening right here in Duluth. He actually had to do a couple weeks in Hibbing where he was going to have to commute. And he was willing to do that. But he did the natural, obeyed God, even though it was going to be hard to make that commute. And a couple, I think it was like a month after working there, maybe not even, all of a sudden Duluth opens up. Oh, you don't got to go to Hibbing anymore. And he works right here. God opened an incredible door. Andy and Steph, our worship leader, our worship leader, they were living out in the same town as me. And, um, and she's also our director up in the kids' factory. She was a teacher. And, um, and he just came and he said, man, we just feel like God's telling us to do this. And so they did. And I'm like, hey, no money in this. You guys are crazy. Same thing happened with them. They actually put their house up for sale. They had it up for sale for a whole whopping three days. And somebody gave them $10,000 more than what they had it priced at. Sold it just like that. And he got to transfer his job where he works at Speedy. And the rest is history. And so what I'm saying is sometimes, I tell you that story because, come on, that's awesome, right? I mean, God's real. God's moving. And this stuff isn't just somebody up here telling you so you might have a good week. This is the stuff that happens when we believe and we walk towards miracles. But here's better yet. This is what happens when we follow Jesus. We do what he did. We experience what he experienced. It's amazing. 
We're somebody's miracle. And today I can tell you that, man, there's so many stories of life change in this church. We've had addictions broken. We've had marriages come together. We've had people right now that are just an absolute mess. And they're choosing to come here and walk towards something because they just feel some type of tug. They don't even really know if they believe in Jesus right now. And man, I'm so glad that they're here. What an opportunity. We've had incredible leaders come from out of town that just happened to like move into town and, and like our production guy and, and, and he has just been a blessing to take us to the next level. I don't know anything about lights or sound or anything. It would be really bad in here if that was up to me, I promise you. It's just incredible what God does and all of this is for you guys and the ones to come in and fill these seats it's for the people that you'll invite, the people that you'll pray for. God wants to use you. You are somebody's miracle. So becoming somebody else's miracle, we're going to kind of just like wrap up here and it'll only be about two and a half more hours. So hopefully you had some coffee. Um, becoming somebody else's miracle. Those were just stories of obedience. Those were stories of doing the natural and then God just taking care of the rest. Incredible, incredible things. John 13, 34, and 35 kind of gives us a hint of where our focus needs to be as we become somebody's miracle. It says this, A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I think he wants us to love one another. We heard that a couple times in there. But here's the deal. Love, love gets misunderstood in our culture. It really just does. I mean, I love my cheeseburger I ate yesterday. I love my kids this morning. I love my wife. I love my van. I love these shoes. I'm a big shoe guy, by the way. Love. It's just misunderstood. And here's the, here's the damage that this does, is that there's a confusion in our culture between lust and love. And God's kind of love... God's kind of love for us is unlike lust because lust is this inward, self-serving type of love. And, and it's wrapping your head about a, what do I need? What do I want? You know, I'm just going to go out here on a, like a little tangent. I don't know why I'm saying this, but I'm just going to go with it. As we've built this church, as we've just kind of obeyed God and he's built this church, I should say, as this has kind of grown, I have heard so many times, and, and the, the people that actually ask this are, are not even here, but they approach and they're like, so what do you guys have to offer? Well, Jesus, <laughs> you know, like a relationship with him, and there's people there, and we got some warm coffee. Um, but they, they're looking at a ministry like a buffet line, like does it, does it have everything that I need? And I understand when you move to a city, you need to look around and see, is this a place I can connect? Is this a place that I can, I mean, I understand all that. But my point is, is that it, it's just this, this self-serving thing of like, does it kind of meet my criteria of everything I want in a ministry? And I'll tell you what, if you really know ministry, you understand ministry is messy and it's hard. And, and it's just, you're kind of always behind working forward, but God just does something in that. And so that shouldn't really be what you're doing. What you should ask yourself is what God's love's really about. And his love is an outward expression and an outward action towards others. It's an outward expression. It's an outward action to others. Maybe you need to ask him, is like, if I'm following you, I'm going to do the things you did. And Lord, where do you see me? What ministry, what area, what city do you see me in? He will show up and he will share that with you. Jesus is saying in this verse, you know, he says that by this, everyone, everyone will know you are my disciples. By this, Duluth, Minnesota, Proctor, Cloquet, Superior, and the surrounding areas will know that you are my church, that you're my disciples, that you're, you're living my principles. It's just by the way that you love each other. You don't have to go out and tell them. By the way that you love each other, they will know. By the way that you love this city, they will know. It takes a little bit of pressure off, doesn't it? And then for some, it, it might even be hard. So, so really, he's saying that our love for one another is how the world will know we are his. And my question to you, just to kind of consider, to think about this week is, what does the world see out of you? What kind of love does he, do they see? Do they see that you're Jesus's or do they see more of like a lustful kind of love that there's this inward 
selfish kind of love going on there. I kind of want to finish it up here today, and uh, it's going to take me <laughs> a little bit longer. I don't usually do passages this long because we want to explain them, but I really want you guys to kind of grab this. And I just want you guys for a minute, just kind of get in your mind's eye, the city of Duluth, our city, Cloquet, the surrounding areas. I'm sorry, I always talk about Duluth. I, I know there's other areas, but kind of get the city and think about, in your mind, the greatest need. No, I mean, we're not going to answer this, so there's no wrong answer here. But what comes to your mind, and again, we're not answering that, the greatest need. And then as we read this practical way to love and what love really looks like, I want us to think and picture what if we could do this as a local body of Christ? What if we could love one another like we're talking here? What if husbands, when we walked in the door at our homes and as we were out in the workplace, we were loving our families this way? Wives, what if we were choosing to love this way that we're getting ready to read? What would that change in our families? What would that change at our workplace, like our bosses? I'll tell you what, I understand that bosses can just be, eh, it's not fun to work with them sometimes. It's not fun. But what would it look like if we lived and loved one another the way that Jesus is telling us to do? If we followed Jesus so closely that we did what he did? What would that look like as we approach the city? What would that look like in this local church? As you start to get to know people and connect and join a grow group. Man, get back there and sign up for grow groups. We're so excited about those. Great way to connect and great way to, to move forward in the process of seeing who Jesus is in your life, your journey. What would this look like? And so I'm just going to read this now, but I want us to all have this thought. I wanted us to get a picture in our mind of what this might look like. This is 1 Corinthians 13. This is going to be familiar to some of us and not so much to others. But here we go. It says, If I speak in tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Here it is. How do we love? How is it not a lustful love, but the love that God requires? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Boy, that's hard. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. Amen. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now I'm going to jump down to verse 13. And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. Faith and hope are the promises that we get to rest in. Faith and hope. You know, Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith, the definition of faith is that we have the assurance in what we hope for. In other words, faith is just knowing that Jesus is who he said he was. Faith is just believing that God has something planned through Engaged Church for this city and all the other ministries around. Faith is just knowing that God has plans for your life to prosper you, not to harm you, and that you are good, not because you say you're good, but because the one who created us says you're good. Faith and hope are the assurance. It's the promises we get to rest in. Life is peaceful when we can understand that. But love is the action that we take because of that. Love is what we choose to do because we understand what we've been given. Jesus says that if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll follow me. And if you believe in me, you're going to do the things I did and even greater. Wow. Man, that fires me up here this morning. I could jump off the stage. That is good stuff. 
Would you guys please stand with me here this morning if you can? It's really kind of hard to put into a practical way, like an action step that we take this week. And the reality is, is that on a Sunday morning, less than 1% of people will hear a message and they'll actually go out into the world and kind of live it out. And that's not something to point my finger at you at all. I just want you to kind of process that for a minute because God is telling you something here this morning. How do we put into action to go out into this world this week in love? Because, I mean, that just looks like a ton of things, right? We could say be polite. We could say open the door for somebody, smile for somebody, give somebody a car, buy somebody a pair of shoes. Lots of things, right? It's hard to really put like this practical step. But this is all I know, is that Jesus wants to start with you. He wants to start with you. And so the choice is yours. Do you believe Jesus is who he said he was? Do you believe for the future that he's going to do what he's already told you, that he's going to do what he's put on your heart? Or do you think that the world just kind of spins by itself and all those chemical reactions in our body are just by chance? I think somebody had a design and a purpose. I want to challenge you guys to be somebody's miracle this week. Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you this morning. Man, you're hitting me hard here this morning. I'm so excited about today. and I've just seen what you've done over the last couple of years, and it's real. But I also know how difficult it is in our lives to accept that, and that's just something that's really sad to me. Lord, I just pray that we can start the journey with you. That we can just start somewhere. That we can believe that love is patient, love is kind, that it doesn't anger quickly, that it doesn't keep a list of wrongs. And that the closer we draw to you, the closer you'll draw to us. See, the reality is, Jesus, we know that we cannot love this way without you. It just becomes a lustful love when we're alone and doing this on our own. So we just ask that you come into our lives. Lord, change our heart, change our perspective, change our minds on the way we're thinking about some things. Just rock our world with the miraculous around us. While every eye is closed and just out of respect of people around you, I just, I always love to give an opportunity just to respond to Jesus. And so maybe some of us here, you know, we, we just, we, we really haven't even stood up and said, you know, I believe, I believe Jesus is who he said he was, but I've never really just said, you know, come into my life, stir me up, start changing me, start this process. I just want to give you an opportunity. Every head's bowed, every eye is closed out of respect for the neighbor around you. But if that's you, would you just raise your hand where you are? I just want to pray for you this week. Amen. Amen. Jesus is right there. He says, I'm at the door knocking. You just open that up and he's going to walk in. He's going to have a meal with you. He's going to sit with you as a friend. Praise God. I just want to pray for those people. If you believe in Jesus, if you have him in your life, will you just pray quietly to yourself just for those people and just kind of worship for what he's doing? I mean, God has broken walls down here today and over the past year and a half, and he's continuing to move us forward. And so just take time to worship him for a moment as I pray for these people. Lord, we love you. We, we are so excited. The purpose that we came to this city, the purpose that we stand up here and give a message, do this music thing that we go out into the city and serve, that we go to other countries and serve, is because we want to see life change. We want to point people towards you. Because we know that you, Lord, not us, you are the one that does that miracle. And so we give that to you. I thank you for each and every one that raised their hand here this morning. And I just pray that you give them an opportunity to talk to somebody, that you give them an opportunity to pray with somebody, that they wouldn't just leave here and kind of feel a tickle in their belly or a goosebump on a goosebump, but they would realize that what just happened was very real. And it's the beginning of something. And that if they will continue to do the natural, you'll continue to do the supernatural in their lives. We love you today, Jesus, and we celebrate you. We pray this in your name. Amen.
You guys, we have a rule here. The next 10 minutes, see three people that you don't know, just say hi. Coffee's hot in the back. You can hang out at the tables. Talk to one another. God bless. We'll see you next week.